emergence in human society of this thing that's called the state. What is the state? The state is this organized bureaucracy. It is the police department. It is the army, the navy. It is the prison system, the courts, and what have you. This is the state. It is a repressive organization. But the state is here. Well, you know, you've got to have the police, because if there were no police, look at what you'd be doing to yourselves. You'd be killing each other if there were no police. But the reality is, the police become necessary in human society. Since the beginnings of modern socialism, socialists have differed on the question of state power. Will it help or hinder us reaching a free socialist society? Over a century later, we're still arguing about this, but often without really engaging with the best arguments for each position. This really bothers us, partly because we're not entirely sure yet ourselves, and partly because much of the discussion out there just doesn't deal with what we think are the most important arguments for each position. If we want socialism to win, we need to get beyond sectarian narrow-mindedness and misrepresentations and get a good understanding of what different socialists think and why, what their best arguments are, and what the historical evidence tells us. So instead of simply picking a side and arguing for it, we want to do something different here. We'll start by reminding ourselves of the kind of socialist society, often called communism, that we want to reach, and use this to take a strategic look at the question of state power. Part 1. The goal of free socialism. The goal of socialism is universal human emancipation. The emancipation of all human beings from capitalism, the state, feudalism, slavery, patriarchy, racism, and all other institutions that prevent us from being free. This would, in Marx's words, be a society where class distinctions have disappeared and all production is concentrated in the hands of associated individuals, based on the free exchange among individuals who are associated on the basis of common appropriation and control of the means of production. This requires the planned distribution of labour time among the various branches of production because it would be absurd to postulate the control by the united individuals of their total production on the basis of exchange value of money. It would replace the hierarchical division of labour entirely and proudly proclaim from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Lots of anarchists and Marxists share this goal. They agree that getting there requires intersectional and international working class struggle against capitalism and the state. And they agree with the immortal words of the First International that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves. Where they start disagreeing is about what we need to do to get there. Let's get clear about two things right away though. First, Marxists and anarchists tend to define the state differently, with anarchists defining the state in part as involving power hierarchies, where one group rules over and dominates another, while Marxists often don't. So for Marx, anything that fulfills certain functions, whether it's hierarchical or not, counts as a state, while for anarchists, an institution fulfilling certain functions but without having hierarchies without having a ruling group ruling over and dominating another, would not count as a state. That's why Marx and Bakunin both look at the Paris Commune, agree on all the details about how it works, free federation, mandated and recallable delegates, and so on. But Marx calls it a revolutionary worker state and talks about how different it is from the bourgeois state it temporarily replaced. While Bakunin calls it just the kind of stateless anarchist transition he supports. So when we talk about the existing state here, what we're referring to is not all the things that might be called states by different people. Rather, we're talking specifically about the kinds of hierarchical, top-down states we have under modern capitalism. <laughs> 
The debate about taking state power is fundamentally about whether we should try to take these institutions over or not. If you think that we should call certain revolutionary political institutions that are, say, not hierarchical or ruled top-down in similar ways, if you think that these things should be called worker states and that they are worth having, that's fine. But the arguments we look at here will not be about those institutions. It's also worthwhile to keep in mind that debates about taking state power didn't start because certain naive anarchists, based on abstract moral ideals, want to keep their hands clean of messy real politics, instead of focusing on the kinds of strategy we need to win meaningful change. There are probably some people like this out there, but as far as we can tell, it doesn't reflect either how these debates arose in the socialist movement or the arguments of its most important and influential thinkers. Rather, these debates arose within radical labor movements already engaged in the messy business of revolutionary class struggle, and it was, and is, essentially about strategy and tactics. Will taking over the capitalist state help us win or not? To answer this question, we're first going through the arguments against taking existing state power, and then looking at some arguments for taking existing state power, before giving some concluding thoughts. Links to each segment can be found in the description. The first argument against taking existing state power is that it isn't enough, by itself, to give us socialism. Everyone basically accepts this now. If there's one thing that a hundred years' history of social democratic parties taking state power and promising to give us socialism has shown us, it's that putting socialists into office isn't enough, on its own, to give us socialism. The second argument against taking over the existing state is that doing so distracts from building the new institutions we need for a free and stateless socialism. History shows, the argument goes, that direct action gets the goods, and that properly bottom-up organized unions, community movements, and so on are just as effective, if not more so, than their more hierarchical counterparts. It might be objected that the rise of socialist candidates inspires popular movements, like the recent teachers' revolts in the US being inspired by Bernie Sanders' 2016 primary run, primarily by talking about four of this movement's leaders. The response has been to point out that two of the only four people that this argument refers to knew each other, and one had been an active union member long before Sanders' presidential bid, that this leaves out the hundreds of other leaders who will never be named because they do not fit this narrative, that in Kentucky it instead grew out of Black Lives Matter organizers, and that the social justice and rank and file caucuses that were important to these latest strikes arguably grew out of other movements like the Occupy movement. Successful direct action movements and political change often come together. We often see things like both a strong labor movement and vaguely pro-labor candidates or parties rising together, as with European social democracy. Unlike what liberals think, just because the state does something doesn't mean that the best or only way to get the state to do what you want is by taking it over. Just like the best way of getting capitalists to do what you want isn't necessarily by becoming the capitalist. So the question is, which is the real reason for the improvements we see? Labour movements have won better wages and conditions around the world in the absence of progressive rule including the recent victorious teacher strikes in the US. They can win political demands as well, such as when the Spanish CNT won the eight-hour working day through a general strike, or when Trump shut down government, lots of air traffic controllers started calling in sick, and the Association of Flight Attendants' president just mentions a general strike, Trump immediately gave in and reopened government. On the other side, we have lots of history showing that even genuinely radical parties, once in power, don't get very much done in the absence of a powerful direct action movement actively pushing for change. Once upon a time, 
Obama got union support by promising the Employee Free Choice Act, which he immediately gave up. And the Marxist party Syriza in Greece betrayed every single one of their promises, from stopping cuts to public services to standing up to the European Union, in less than a single administration. This has a long history that goes back to the late 18 and early 1900s as one of the standard ways that people became anarchists across the world, from Lucy Parsons in the US to Kurt Kosciuszko in Japan, was their perception that parliamentary politics was ineffective at winning reforms, much less building towards revolution compared to direct action. There's also another position that says that evidence, at least from some countries like the US, indicates that social movements are much more likely to be able to fight and win under governments that essentially allow them to, or don't repress them too harshly. And there are combined approaches to transition, like 21st century socialism and democratic confederalism, that try to take existing state power on some level, while also insisting on the need for social movements autonomous from the state and party to counter the extra-parliamentary power of capital. In terms of just winning reforms, the questions we're left with are these. Are there significant historical examples where electoral work really achieves something without a powerful direct action movement pushing it? If not, then should we either focus on organizing outside of the existing state, or seek a combined approach of some kind, and if so, which one? Finally, from the perspective of deciding how best to spend our time, what evidence is there for people devoting lots of time and energy to participating in the capitalist state process being more effective than devoting it to direct action outside of it? Let's get back to the question of revolution. The third argument starts from the important materialist idea that the social relations you're part of determine that they shape and influence your agency and your consciousness. If someone becomes a rich and powerful capitalist, chances are they're going to find ways of justifying their position of wealth, power and privilege, develop some solid upper-class consciousness, and try to fight things like unions, strikes and workers' control. Similarly, this argument says, if you put someone into institutions like the capitalist state, their newfound position of wealth, power and privilege, these new social relations they're inserted into, will change them. They'll probably quite like their newfound positions of greater power, wealth and privilege, and come to hang out more and more with upper class people who also enjoy them. Gradually, they'll find ways of justifying their positions to themselves and others, come to see them as indispensable and valuable to society. And since they'd lose this in the transition to a free, stateless socialism, they will end up fighting against such transition. Thus, in the words of the anarchist thinker and geographer Reclus, socialist leaders who, finding themselves caught up in the electoral machine, end up being gradually transformed into nothing more than bourgeois with liberal ideas. They have placed themselves in determinate conditions that in turn determine them. Someone might object that this only applies to capitalist states, not revolutionary states, where we'd all be comrades in some sense. From a materialist perspective, however, from the perspective of focusing on material social relations between people, this would work only if the new thing that you call the state doesn't involve a minority of people ruling over others with greater power, wealth and privilege as a result. If you still have hierarchical social relations like this in the new state and want to reach a free and non-hierarchical society like what Marx calls communism, the argument still applies since it would still be contrary to the interests of this ruling minority to give up their position to the people they rule over. Just like socialists think you can't rely on the benevolence of slave owners, feudal lords, capitalists, monarchs or bourgeois politicians to give workers what they want, so, this argument goes, it would be naive to think that any other ruling minorities would be any different. Many people use this to explain why, 
In their view, every Marxist seizure of existing state power has failed to produce anything like the free, stateless society they aimed for. In fact, this is where social democracy comes from. The vast majority of social democratic parties started life as radical Marxist parties. Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg and others were all in the Second International once upon a time. Gradually, these parties became more and more reformist, even before having any real power, emphasizing taking parliamentary power and limiting what unions they controlled were allowed to do. The shift to mere reformism caused a scandal when Edward Bernstein pointed it out, largely because he made explicit and advocated what a lot of the German Social Democratic Party actually were like and were really doing. They eventually supported the imperialist First World War, which caused the split where Lenin, Luxembourg and others formed the revolutionary Third International. When the German Revolution happened after the First World War, the Social Democrats beat down the revolution and murdered its leaders. Though most Social Democratic parties' history is less exciting, they've all gone from radical beginnings to merely focusing on reforming and governing capitalism to basically just becoming neoliberals. When it comes to the parties of the revolutionary Third International, so this argument goes, things are a lot more complicated. Whatever else you might want to say about, say, the USSR, it never went stateless, it never had the associated producer's self-direct production, or distributed according to need. That is, after all, why they call it the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, because their theory said that the state-led stage of socialism would come before and inevitably lead to the free and stateless communism that they aimed for. We once got some flack in another video for pointing out that the USSR wasn't communist in a Marxist sense, which was really weird because we were just pointing out a fact that all of orthodox Marxist-Leninist-Stalinist theory agrees on, while they were ironically agreeing with Western anti-communist propaganda that confuses the name of the communist party with the kind of society they claimed to have built. This doesn't mean that these states haven't achieved lots of things. Vanguard parties taking state power have definitely been able to rule states over time, industrialize, improve living conditions, fight off Western imperialism, and a lot more. Social democratic parties have also overseen significant social reforms in many countries, which have also improved things like living standards, though, as we mentioned above, their exact causal role is a bit unclear. These are some very important things that cannot be denied. We also know that non-socialist revolutionary armies, like those led by Simón Bolívar, that liberated much of Latin America from the Spanish Empire, can also do things like fight off Western imperialism and produce meaningful social reform. We don't have a lot of good information about whether anarchist movements could effectively do the same, since after 1917, the standard model that much of the world's anti-imperialist movement followed was Third International Marxism. A lot of online debate is very US-centric on these things. It inverts the standard liberal and conservative ideology, holding that everything the American empire does is good, to holding that everything that opposes the US empire is good, in a way that leaves the US-centric nature of the whole thing intact. Look, there are a lot of things that can effectively resist the US empire, like the Taliban. But that doesn't make the societies they are creating good, or mean that they get us towards free socialism. Let's remind ourselves of the fact that the disagreement here is whether taking over the capitalist state will work to get us to free and stateless socialism, self-governed by the associated producers. In this light, there are two questions we think are especially important for thinking about this disagreement today. First, has any single example of taking existing state power ever looked like it was really progressing towards a fully free and stateless society, with people collectively self-directing their lives and production. Secondly, why have so many of them relapsed into capitalism even after they won and secured the rule, or, despite having relatively secure governments, seem to be sliding back towards capitalism again? <laughs>
Part 3. Arguments for seizing the capitalist state. Of the socialist arguments for taking over the existing state, there seem to be three that are most influential today. The first argument we want to mention is that taking over a centralized hierarchical state is necessary for things like effective coordination, planning, and social organization in contemporary society. Perhaps that's because of the supposed necessities of large-scale coordination in complex societies with millions of people. Or perhaps it's because of the technical requirements of complex machinery, technology, industry, and so on. Either way, the argument goes that something like a centralized hierarchical state of the kind we have under capitalism is necessary for any contemporary society to function well, plan properly, and generally coordinate and make sure that society keeps on running. This argument isn't so much an attack on the tactics of taking state power, as it is an attack on the idea of communism. If communism is free and stateless, as Marx and others say it is, and the state is necessary for modern society to function properly, then communism is impossible in modern society. If this argument is right, contra Marx and others, communism is impossible for us to reach. Weirdly, there are a fair few Marxists who make this argument without seeming to realize that it undermines the entire goal of basically all of Marxism, from Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, to Maoism, to council communism. Since this is an argument against the socialism that anarchists and Marxists aim for, not an argument about why we need to use the existing states to reach such a society, we're going to leave it aside for now. There's a possible response to this that says that we need a state during and immediately after a revolution to defend against capitalist attack, but that after world socialism has been achieved, we can then transition to a fully free and stateless communism. This brings us to the second argument for taking existing state power, which is that it is necessary for military defense. The argument here is that states or state-like structures are particularly, perhaps uniquely, good at warfare, and that being good at warfare is necessary to defend the revolution against attacks from capitalist powers. This is a very real threat. The Russian revolution was immediately attacked by the US and European powers, as well as the ruling classes. The Chinese Communist Party fought a long and bloody civil war before finally emerging victorious, and the Vietnamese revolutionaries first fought against the French Empire to liberate the North, then had to fight the American Empire to liberate the South, and then, after invading Cambodia to stop the famine under Pol Pot, had to fight off a Chinese invasion as well. Part of this argument seems right. States definitely can fight wars. It's a bit tricky to see whether they're uniquely good or necessary to do it, since after 1917 almost all the main struggles for socialism tended to take a state-centered approach. There are only a handful of exceptions to look at of attempted transitions without taking existing state power. For instance, the Shinmin Commune of 1929-31 certainly was defeated militarily by the Japanese Empire. The Maknavites did manage to liberate much of Ukraine during the Russian Revolution and effectively defeat the counter-revolutionary armies they faced before being betrayed by the Bolshevik allies. Makhno himself argued that although the army itself needed centralized command, it should still have elected officers and in turn be under the command of non-hierarchical federations organizing from the bottom up. So even if we think that armies require a degree of top-down command powers, the argument goes, it simply doesn't follow that the rest of society needs to be organized in this way. The anarchist armed forces seem to have been even more effective than the republican counterparts during the Spanish Revolution before the anarchists put them under government control, which they were strongly criticized for by other anarchists. Finally, the Zapatistas have managed to not only survive and improve their society, but also recently announced a major expansion all the while without taking existing state power. There's a lot less historical evidence to go on here than we'd like, and certainly a lot less than there is for, say, Marxist-Leninist-Stalinist or Maoist approaches. But we do think it shows that military defense is at least possible 
without taking over the existing state, especially if, like the Zapatistas, they don't either join a hierarchical state or rely on allies who do. I don't think I'm in a position to say much about whether it's more or less effective, all things considered. Here, there are two questions I think we should think about going forward. First, how essential is military defense, as opposed to other forms of resistance, violent or not, going to be for today's socialists? Second, if it is important, can it be effectively carried out without capitalist-type hierarchical state machinery today? A third argument is that taking over the existing state is necessary because that's the only way to plant the seeds of a free and stateless socialism under capitalism. The argument goes that while capitalist social relations already sprouted within feudalism, free socialist ones don't under capitalism. So only by taking over the existing capitalist state can socialists begin to create the conditions that allow them to move gradually toward establishing socialist relations of production in the various economic spheres of the society. By doing this, the state can help to overcome capitalism's social fragmentation, change its individualistic culture, and help teach people how to organize production from the bottom up. Anarchists would respond that, in a sense, capitalism doesn't inherently and of itself simply contain the institutions we need for a free socialist society. But it does, as Marx points out, generate a working class movement that's capable of creating them. History shows us plenty of examples of workers creating Soviets, factory committed, and other institutions that can take over production and replace capitalist top-down organization with bottom-up workers' control. It also generates labor movements and organizations, which can prefigure free socialist institutions by themselves organizing in free ways. We should remember here that the vast majority of the world's radical labor movements were set up and organized by anarchists and syndicalists before 1917, organizing people on scales of hundreds of thousands and sometimes even millions of people and winning major social reforms. A defender of Harnecker's argument can respond by arguing that it will be much more effective and reliable if the state can be used to help create, protect and nurture and support organizations like bottom-up community councils and a non-capitalist social economy that can in turn gradually replace the hierarchical capitalist state with a free and stateless form of social organization. How plausible you think this is will ultimately depend on your answers to a number of questions like, first, in light of the arguments about how taking over the existing state changes those who do so, and the history of the last century, can you rely on the state to actually do this consistently for a long enough time to get to free socialism? If you have doubts about that, but think that maybe independent social movements and organizations outside of the state, like unions, could pressure and keep the state on track, how do you do that in practice? If, as this argument suggests, there are ways of combining certain forms of prefigurative politics with certain kinds of existing state power, how exactly should we go about doing so? Part 4. Conclusion We're deliberately not trying to argue for any one specific point here, partly because we're not sure ourselves but there are some general lessons we want to mention that we do think we're clear about. First, social movements and organizations like unions and ecological movements must retain their autonomy from both states and political parties. Co-optation by social democratic parties and their power to disempower unions over time is one of the main things that stopped social progress in Europe and laid the grounds for neoliberalism. We must avoid the same mistake. Second, we must recognize that working class organization is key to winning our demands. Working class organization is key not only to the victories affecting specific groups of workers, but to much broader demands as well. For example, a recent study showed that mass protest movements are most likely to result in democratization if led by the working class. This coupled with the wealth of historical evidence of workers' organization leading to better societies across the board 
suggests that if we want the climate and other movements to win, we need to make sure that it's led by the working classes, not the middle, and certainly not the ruling classes. Third, we all need to think very seriously about where to devote our time and energy. Building movements takes time, but so does building parties. Above all, we need to actually win both reforms in the present and the kind of long-term social change that takes us from capitalism to a free future society that can help us deal with the climate crisis. As you can tell from this video and how we laid it out, we're quite sure that we don't have all the answers to this. And you probably don't either. But we hope that this helps us understand the positions and arguments involved better so that we can find them. Thank you.